All right. Well, welcome to the Real Estate of Mind show, where we help everyday people build wealth through real estate investing. And I am your host, Glenn Schwarm. And again today, I am flying solo. My beautiful wife is uh, out and about today and not able to join us, but she's going to be very disappointed because our special guest speaker is from her hometown today. So she'll be very upset about that. But um, listen, I'm lucky to have our special guest speaker here, who is Jay Matheson from Dallas, Texas. Hey, Jay. Hey there. Glad to have you with us today. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me. What's the weather like down in Dallas today? Well, it's sunny and nice and unusually, not not unusually warm like it like it normally would be. Yeah. Um, we're in the 70s and 80s, which is uh, kind of nice. Well, that, that is nice. We're, having a, we're having a nice day here in New York today. It's not uh, it's not normally it's it's normally cold. It's been very cold here. So we're starting to see some sunshine, which is nice. I have to hear from my wife every single day about how much she hates the weather up here because she was brought up in Dallas. And I love Dallas, but I have to tell you, I was down there in August one time. And I thought that when I opened the door, I thought that the heat punched me in the face when I walked out the door. <laughs> right, right. Yes. It, are you it can a, get very hot in the summer. Um, are you a Dallas native? Uh, I grew up in Oklahoma, actually. Oh, okay. And I, I ran to Texas as fast as I could. Um, <laughs> But no, I've been here uh, 20, I don't know, 22 years, maybe. Okay. I've been here a while. Well, cool. We're, we're in, I think we're in different kind of ends of the real estate spectrum. Um, I do residential uh, work mm -hmm. and I do a lot of that, uh, wholesaling, flipping and all that coaching, whatever, all that kind of stuff and uh, single families, whatnot. And you do, you're in commercial. So tell our audience, if you would, kind of about you, what you do and what you specialize in, all that kind of stuff. Let me hear more about you. So. So first of all, I'm a licensed architect in the state of Texas. That's how I got into commercial real estate. I uh, got out of college with an architecture degree and uh, went to work practicing architecture um, and just basically learned the commercial real estate business through, through the experiences I got with the firms I worked at. Um, over the years, I became curious because uh, if you know anything about architects, they don't make a lot of money. Um, we get to spend a lot of other people's money, but we don't make a lot of money. And the problem I had was I could never spend enough money to build what I really wanted to build. And I felt like if, if our clients would have given us a little more leeway and a little more money, uh, we could have built a better product for them and, um, you know, probably would have had a higher resale value later and later on. So because of my frustrated architect, uh, issues i decided i can do this i'm going to figure this out on my own and so um i started out in the space you're talking about uh, the residential okay. space okay so on so on the weekends i would go out and and i would find empty plots of land around dallas and this was a time before uh all those empty plots that i programmed out have been built out and most of them have been built out exactly like i figured they were going to get built out uh, but I went around and found empty pieces of land and I would mock up what a deal would look like on that land. And most of these were townhome developments. Um, so they were single family townhomes, fee simple. There was no, I would not do a condo deal to save my life. And I still wouldn't today because, you know, in times like right now, yeah. the bank is not going to lend a dime on a condo deal. Right. Uh, but they'll lend you money all day long on a fee simple piece of property. And so even though the emphasis, you know, and I get it, the condo guys, um, you know, they'll build an eight unit building or a 12 unit building or whatever they build. And they're saving a lot of money because they don't have to put in the individual infrastructure for for each unit. Utilities mainly is the issue yeah. uh, being, you know, sewer, water, uh, those things. So, you know, the condo guys don't want to spend all that extra money to individually hook up all those units and buy all the taps and do everything you need to do. Uh, I would, you know, I refuse to do that. And let me tell you, we got hit in the 2008 downturn. And if it hadn't been for the fact that I had done fee simple townhomes, we would have been cooked. Um, tell our listeners what a fee simple deal is so they know. So, so in a condo, there are two types of residential properties. Be happy to tell you that. Um, there's fee simple, which fee simple, the best way to think of it, it's like going and buying just a standalone single family home with 
you know, however many bedrooms, however many bathrooms. It's got its own water meter. What makes it fee simple is it's got its own water meter. It's got its own sanitary sewer hookup. It's got its own electricity. It's got its own cable, its own telephone, whatever it needs. It's got it all. And it own and you own the dirt under that building, under that house. That is a fee simple property. Yep. A condo property, a lot of times what you'll see on small condo developments, which we see I see a lot of them in Dallas, and I know they're prevalent in in all other communities across the US and unless city regulations don't allow it. What you'll see is they'll build a essentially what looks like a small apartment building. Um, and they'll put all the utilities on one end of the building and they'll they'll run it through the building and attach each unit to that main line. Okay. So you could have a gas line, an electric line, um, you know, all of those things are attached and they're shared. They're essentially shared back to a master meter. Uh, and usually what they do is they subdivide it and the and the electric company and the city and everybody can handle that usually. Okay. Um, and they do that because A, they don't have to buy a bunch of extra, like for the, wa for the water, you don't have to pay the city. If you had an eight unit building you built on a, on a uh, you know, like a hundred by 150 lot, it, you're, you're only gonna, uh, you're only gonna get, you're only gonna pay for one tap to the city. Okay. So that, that's why they do it. If you did it the way I do it, you're buying eight taps and at a couple thousand dollars a tap, you know, that adds that that comes to the sure. bottom line is is profit you're not getting. Sure. I just think it's a not a it's not a good way. It's not giving the end buyer the best solution. At least I know when when I do these deals and I do them fee simple, um, that no matter what the economic situation is at the time. The buyer can always sell their home without pushback from the bank. And I can always sell my product without pushback from the bank because they know that they are taking title to that piece of land and that piece of the building. So you, you have no involvement after, like a condo development has some involvement after. In yours, there's no involvement after. Is that correct? Or is there some involvement after? Is it well, there, there, yeah, there is some involvement after. Um, what happens is it depends on the development. There's usually going to be an HOA because okay. you're going to have some sort of HOA because you're going to have landscaping that's that's sure. kind of shared amongst the amongst sure. all the property owners. Um, you're going to have a driveway that's shared by all the property owners in one of these developments. You're going to have um, you know those are pretty much the basic things. If it's big enough that they could have a pool house or whatever, like if you. You know, if you went out in the suburbs, a lot of times what you'll see is, um, you know, uh, Pulte and name a big builder. They'll build a clubhouse with a pool and everybody that lives in that community is going to pay HOA dues to take care of the pool and the landscaping, mowing the lawn, doing whatever, okay. fixing the okay. street. So you, so you got the same thing. It's just on a smaller scale. So, yeah, yeah there, there usually is an HOA component and or there can be but it really depends on the design of the property and whether that's warranted or not okay. a lot of times you know um uh in a condo regime or a condominium building you're going to have an hoa because now sure. you're sharing utilities you're sharing everything yeah. and it makes a stickier mess and banks don't banks lenders don't like it fannie doesn't like right. it you know all the those guys don't like it so if you can do a deal, if you can set up a deal and do it without doing it as a condo, it, you'll be better off in the long run. You probably could get a premium for that. How many, when you when you do units, like how many do you, when you're building a townhome, what do you call it, development? Call it a townhouse development? Is yeah, it's a development. How many, are, what's your average size? Oh yeah, that's true, that's true. What's your average size of, of units, I'll call it? How many townhouses are you usually so, doing? If I was, I'm not doing any, I haven't done any in a while, but um, if I was going to do one, average size would be anywhere between 1,700 square feet and 2,200 square feet. Okay. And we might, depending on the configuration of the property, we might have a couple of 3,000 square foot units, you okay. know, that 
might be three bedroom units, whereas everything else might be uh, two bedroom or, or you know, some variation. It just sure. depends on what you can fit in there. Um, you know, usually those those units are going to lay out to be 20 feet wide, 22 feet wide, somewhere in there. Okay. And somewhere around 35 to 40 feet long. That's going to be basically your footprint on the ground. Okay. How many how many units would be in that? How many? It just depends. It depends on the piece of land you get, well, right? Well, like we did the last deal we did, it was about a a third, uh, about a half acre of land. I think it was around 22,000 square feet of land. And we were able to fit 17 units on it. Wow. That's pretty, that's pretty good building right there to figure that out. Yeah. A, it sounds like a lot to me when I think of a half acre of land. Some of our building lots, we're in upstate New York. Some of our building lots are four acres. So that's for one house. So it just depends on the land, I'm sure. Well, yeah. Right. So, I mean, but, but think about that. If you're, if, if you're a, um, if you're a developer or you're an investor and you you want to go build a deal from scratch, I mean, you're going to have to go through the entitlement process. And, you know, entitlements like we have a deal we're working on right now in New London up here up in your area. OK, um, but it's a it's an apartment deal. Um, but but nonetheless, and, and the codes there, the way the city does the codes is completely <laughs> different than the way they do them in Texas. Sure. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, most of the southern states are a lot like Texas. Uh, a lot of places, Colorado is like Texas. A lot of places acts like, works like Texas from a regulatory standpoint. Yeah. But when you go up in the New England states, it's it's a little bit different game. Um, actually, I'm kind of like surprised laws by some here. of the things they do. They like their but, laws up here, Jay, that's for sure. They like laws yeah. and regulation. They Ugh, they spend lots well, of time. But but what I was going to say is, if you're an investor and you're going, I want to get an investment in this particular market, and you you can't buy the investment you want, and you need to build the investment you want, then this is something to think about. What if there was a, I mean, think about it now. There's going to be a lot of retail stores that aren't going to be around anymore. So what if there was a four acre, two acre, one acre property? that you could buy on the cheap, either out of bankruptcy or it's distressed or they just want to unload it. And, and you could plan out a little townhome deal and it's a hot market that people want to be in. Yeah. Um, you know, maybe that's a thing to do. Um, I would certainly look at that. I mean, you, you're, you're going to have a lot more upside there than you would, um, you know, with some other things. Sure. So, no, I understand. And so it, it really you, depends on you. You know, it depends on the individual investor and what their appetite is for, sure. for that kind of risk. So what are you doing? What are you doing now? Like now, like I mean, we talked about the fee simple and the condos. Is that what you're doing now? Or are you doing what, what are you doing now? Like, what's your focus? I'm, I'm focused on uh, multifamily. Uh, mostly we look at some student housing, but we're we're not. Uh, uh, we've kind of pulled back on student housing because I have a lot of concerns now with social distancing, with everything that's going on, that that universities aren't going to operate like they used to operate. I really, I really have a lot of concern about that. I'm, I, it's it's kind of a wait and see situation. I mean, you know, uh, just just this week, University of California, they have over 500,000 students and, and faculty that attend their campuses on an annual basis. And they decided not to hold classes. The cl the campuses are closed for the fall of 2020. They closed so, for the fall already. Yeah, so if you're a student housing guy in one of those markets, you gotta yeah. be scratching your head going, holy cow, am I what about happened? to- Yeah, what happened? Like a big one here, cause I got no cash flow whatsoever. Yeah. You know, the second thing is, this is where I really think it's going to sting, is I think universities, I mean, there's, this is a toss up. I've been reading a lot about this. There's two th two ways to look at this. Number one, universities are a business, uh, especially, you know, the private ones and whatnot. Um, but the state run universities, you know, they've got to make money too. Um, all these universities have to make money. If you start to look at it, a lot of these universities make their revenue off sports. That's where their well, revenue is coming point. from. Great point. Yeah. So 
they're going to be incentivized to figure out how to bring that back to life to make that revenue. And by the way, from what I read, most the the bigger chunk of revenue from the sports events comes from the fact from ticket sales, popcorn, candy, and sure. paraphernalia. Sure, you know, the high margin stuff. That's where the mar the majority of their funds come from. It's not coming from uh brand deals or or marketing at the stadium or what whatever that case may be so so on the one side they're going to try to figure out every way they can to bring that back to life because that's a major source of income for those universities whichever ones they are on the flip side though what i think is going to happen is students are going to wake up and realize that and and maybe campuses are going to realize that hey if we can teach everybody online, why the hell do we need all these buildings anymore? And why do we need to have um, why do we need to have these meetings on campus? Now, I'll I'll add a caveat to that, or or actually a thought. As I think through this, I'm like, you know, this is an opportunity for campuses to raise the bar on what it costs in tuition by segregating those that want to do it virtually for one price which might look like the price you would pay today if you could actually go. And those that really want to do the in-person experience that might pay double the tuition and less, and, and the university therefore has a smaller population on campus. Um, and that's how you get the one-on-one -on -one experience by paying a premium. Mm, interesting. I had not thought of that concept. Yeah. I, I don't know. I mean, it's kind of the, you know, so now it's going to be the elite of the elite get to go to campus on campus in person with the professors. Right. But most people would just do the virtual online stuff. So, you know, I don't know where this is going. And frankly, I don't think any of the educators know where it's going. But nonetheless, I do believe that student housing is going to be in a bit of hurt come this fall yeah. in a lot of markets. And with California's announcement this week, I can cer certainly see student housing uh, and apartments around those campus locations in California uh, experiencing some pain. Yeah. So, yeah, that would be big. So you're the ones you build now are more are they student? Well, you don't build student housing now. You're building just traditional apartments. How big of a how big a U.S. are you building? So. Well, we most of the projects we look at are, you know, 30 to 50, 60, 70 million dollars that okay. they're big. Okay. Um, you know, we don't if you're going to go build something uh, and I'm not I'm not advocating that you can't build less units because there are places where that makes sense. Um, but it really is a function of rent. And when you look at land prices, um, land prices really uh, set the bar for what you can develop and what you've got to to build density wise to be able to cover the cost of of the whole thing and make it profitable for your investors. You know, you're you're going to need to hit 15 to 20 percent IRR in this mark in this well in the climate prior crash you would be you know investors were accepting 15 to 20 percent IRR. It's okay, they'll take that. Uh, you know. Uh, 2012, 2010, somewhere in there, investors were demanding the 20% RR. Land prices were cheaper. There was lots of ways to make profit on develop, developments. That you know, as the market gets tighter, it just it just becomes less efficient yeah. uh, from, a, from an earnings perspective. So uh, that's, I mean, so we we size our deals you know anywhere from 200 to 300 units usually is around where you want to be you know the other thing is you don't want to build a you know i've seen guys come in and say well i want to do 700 units here well the problem with 700 units is you can't build them fast enough uh usually the bank's going to want you to phase it <laughs> sure sure yeah right and their risk right yeah. so let's assume they say that well the next thing that's going to happen is you're going to build, so they're going to let you build 300 units. You build 300 units, your leasing team is off and running, they get the whole thing leased, and a year later the bank says, okay, you can build the other phase, that was successful, it looks great. So you get the other phase built, and then what you discover is 
you're basically eating your face off because you've got leases expiring in the old building and you're trying to fill up the new building. And so people are like, you know, it, it, it can be a mess, you know. Oh, interesting. Um, th th there's some challenges there to doing yeah. that. Jay, so, tell, tell people, we're, I, I, we're not done, but I wanted to make sure people know how to get a hold of you. So our listeners, tell me how they can find you, how they can get a hold of you. and. So our, um, our main focus is, is lending right now. Um, although we're not doing any because of the market, we're trying to figure out where we're going with things. Yeah. Uh, and that, that is at TrivectaCapitalGroup.com. Trivecta um, so that's T-R-I-V-E-C-T-A capitalgroup.com and uh but you know we're, we've got some things coming up with this downturn i think we're we're in the process of uh putting together uh our first uh distressed debt investment fund we'll probably try to come out of the gate at 250 million uh we'll be looking for investors for that um and i think we'll be real successful at it and frankly it doesn't have, we're probably going to have a couple of different brackets in that investment that you can put yourself in um uh where we, we see we like to lend the way we like to lend is we want to be the senior lender and in some cases we might want to be a a mezzanine lender as well okay um so that we can control if if the developer screws up we have enough knowledge to go out there take the deal over and fix it and, okay. and sell it because one thing we're not going to do is lose money sure um, i can't promise we're going to make money but by golly we're going to do everything we can to not lose money and so protecting investors principal is is you know priority number one for us who's your um, primary who's your primary uh person that you're looking to get money from as a lender then who's your the people that you want to lend to well so high net worth individuals are the only people we'll consider we're not going to do they need to be accredited investors yep. uh, you know the typical thing um preferably you know who who uh you know we're not going to do a fund where the masses the public the general public can invest uh that's just not something we want to deal with as much as i'd like to help those folks um you know there's a lot of headaches that come with that that we just don't really sure. want to deal with at this time. Sure. I understand. Um, yeah. They're not, so, they don't have the stomach for that maybe. Right. Yeah. But that's, that's what we would be targeting. Um, and, and that's how we would do it. Who are you lending to? So these are, these are larger, also large. Yeah, commercial. So I kind of, I, I have a, um, we want to lend to guys who have capital and they can they can do the they can do a deal. They've got equity money, they're not broke. Um, but you know, maybe the banks aren't giving them uh, you know, the preference they deserve. Uh maybe they've got a great project in a great location, but they're capital constrained a little bit. Uh those are the kind of developers we want to work with. Mm -hmm. Um you know we've been getting a lot of hotel deals lately and we're just turning them down left to right because i don't know where hotels are going either right. and so we're not we're not focusing on that at the moment um multi-family deals we would look at but i we've got to be careful with those too because uh you know the market is taking a somewhat of a correction but i still don't think it's corrected and um you know it's yet to be seen whether people are going to get their jobs back. Um, and, and I could go into a whole spiel about that, but I won't. Sure. Um, there, I'm, some people are probably gonna go back to work, but there's gonna be a significant, I'd say at least a third of everybody that's been laid off will not go back to work. The other agree. two thirds may go back to work and they may suffer some sort of pay cut doing it. Um, yeah. but, but it's hard to say, I, I don't know. Uh, it may be that only 50% of the workforce that's been laid off goes back to work. Yeah. Um, I mean, this thing is bizarre. It It is the weirdest. It is. Uh, and what, what baffles me, uh, and sorry, I'm getting off topic here. But no, it's okay. No, it's fine. <laughs> what baffles me about the whole thing is that, is that you got Bill Gates, who's been saying for years, a pandemic could be our worst threat ever. Yet, 
you on the other hand, you hear the Fed and the Treasury and a lot of other people saying, oh my gosh, this is like an economic event we never thought of. And I'm like, well, you knew that there was a possibility of a pandemic. How could you not have, you know, hypothetically come up with scenarios that yeah. that might have predicted how this was going to go? Yeah. Um, you know. It's, it's it's crazy. It, it is crazy. You're lending you're lending size, not lending now. You said, which is you're waiting. You're sitting yeah, back. Yeah, we're we're kind of on hold. We're just we're looking around for deals. You know, if we see something we really really like, we might, yeah. you know, stretch and try to do it. Uh, but we're just not, you know, until things get stabilized over the next six months. I don't think, and and six months I might might not be long enough. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, there's a, a lot of things that are. Um, in flux at the moment the you know I have, to, I have to go way back when we first started talking here and, and yeah. uh i was thinking about your your roots as an architect and um i building houses i never really once in a while we'll have an architect for a drawing or for support beams or something like that and so we had our office done and i i didn't like the fee right i wasn't used to those kind of fees our office is a four hundred thousand dollar office building we built it's not enormous but it's a nice little yeah. spot but you know i think our architect feedback then was Twenty five, thirty grand, and I didn't like that. I was like, "What?" And I know that's probably cheap. Normally, it's ten to fifteen percent of the of the project, right? Well, an architect's fee could range anywhere from five to fifteen percent. Yeah. Okay. Of the so, construction costs. I didn't realize the the value of an architect yeah. until this. Around the same time, we redid our own house, and we bought a short sale. And my, if you know my wife, she just over the top makes everything look beautiful, and you know. My brothers come in and say, "What do you live in an Olive Garden? What is this place?" Because that's the way my <laughs> wife is decorated. So, so that's how we joke. But, but my we in our bathroom, she put all this tile. Like we have a we have a giant uh, we have a hot tub, which now of course we never use anymore. But there's a hot tub in the in the bathroom. We have a we have a big walk-in shower, and there's tile up and down the walls, and there's decor. Well, we weren't too far in the house a year or two later, and we start seeing cracks along our tile floor. Mm -hmm. And I talked to an architect friend of mine at a group that I run here locally. And he said, yeah, you need support. Did you have an architect look at that? I said, no. He said, can you imagine how much that tile weighs? Just think about how much yeah. one packet of tile weighs and think about how many packets you bought. He said, that's what you put on that frame. And I, I thought, so worth it if I just had an architect come in that job. Now, I know it's a much smaller scale than what you work on, but the principle is the same. That's You guys well, really think through things we don't think about. Well, that's true, um, but I've done plenty of single family homes over the years and I've built, a, I mean, I've designed and built several custom homes for, for different friends of mine. And, and those are all things, you know, I mean, not only do they hire me, we, I make them hire a structural engineer to make sure that we're not going to have foundation problems. Um, right. You know, uh, you know, up, I think up there in your neck of the woods, they do, uh, everything's slab on grade probably right with spread footings yeah uh well we have basements here is that what yeah. you're asking yeah no not the basement but just the foundation that holds the building up you know in texas we have a lot of clay soils and so the soil tends to move around a lot yeah and so the preferred the the optimal method of building is called pier and beam you drill big concrete shafts in the ground and then you build a concrete beam that connects all those piers together and then you set the house on top of that. And that way the earth can move around and not move the house, which okay. causes cracking in your tile, yeah. um, the, the settling, those kind of things. Yeah. So, I mean, I won't do a house unless we can do it that way. If someone asked me to do it differently, I'm just say no. Yeah. Not, um, well, you know, you, you know what the outcome is going to be a year. You know, down the road, you're going to have problems if you don't do it the right years way. So. Now they're going to have problems. Yeah. It might not be immediate, but it'll happen. Yeah. And, you know, it goes, this kind of goes hand in hand with the, the conversation we were having earlier about the condo deal. Developers trying to save money any way he can so his profit margin goes up. Because yeah. maybe as investors, he's got a service, you know, maybe it's not all his money. I don't know. Sure. Um, but it's something like that. That's how the story goes. Yeah. Or it's just good old fashioned greed, you know. Yeah, that's true. That always plays a part. <laughs> you so, know, we talk about. You talk about foundations, and I was uh, one of the things that I teach in our seminars. I talk about the the very first day we do a three day workshop called the Home Flipping Workshop, and we teach people how to you know flip houses and whatnot. And the first day I spend the first morning talking about their mental mindset, and I always say, you know, your 
your, I say, what's the most important part of a house? And they eventually get around to saying the foundation. I say, right, so what's the most, most important part of your business? And they finally say, well, me. And I say, right, so you're the foundation of your business. So we're going to spend the morning working on you and your foundation. And so I wanted to ask as we're kind of wrapping up, you, you know, you've obviously been very successful in life and you've got yourself to a great position, but uh, we're, we're big believers that you've got to have a strong mental mindset to get to where you're at. You've got to make sure you monitor your thoughts, all that kind of stuff. And I'm wondering what, what you have done to get to where you are in life mentally. Like, what do you, what do you do to keep yourself sharp and, you know, in the game and mentally getting the right thoughts? And some people are pre-programmed that way and some people are not. Depends how they're raised right. and a lot of that. So I wonder what you do. Well, that's a great question. Um, number one, I work out. I, I go, well, I used to go to the gym. Can't do that right now. Um, <laughs> and it's killing me because I can't even buy a weight. I don't own any weights at home. You can't buy them at the store. They sell out as fast as they get them. It's crazy. Um, I mean, here in uh, the gym's finally opened here. I haven't been yet. I'm a little hesitant about whether I want to do that or not. Sure. Uh, but I also, I used to, I've got a road bike and I used to ride a lot. And so I've started riding again. Uh, for exercise. I can't run because I have a torn ACL. I've got to get fixed. Uh, and even after I fix it, I don't think I could run uh, <laughs> yeah. or I don't want to. Um, so I work out. I try to exercise. Uh, I try to eat right. Um, you know. Any books you listen to or any, any books you read or listen to so, an audible or anything that yeah, you like? I was going to say, so the next thing is, um, you know, there's quite a few people on social media I follow and and listen to, um, and you know, I've learned a ton from that. And then reading books, lots of books I read. There's got, but I have, <clears throat> I have more books to read than I've got time to read them. Um, and yeah. I still haven't figured out how to overcome that one um, yet. Yeah. But um, you know, those are kind of the things I do, and I try to keep a positive mindset. You know, I I think the big thing for me is that. I love what I'm doing. And, you know, even in the years when I wasn't making a lot of money, I still loved what I was doing. And every day, no matter how beat down I would be from whatever, the next day I would get up and it was a new day and I would get up and go at it again. And I just kept doing that and I've continued doing that and I'm still doing it today. Um, and then most importantly, I would tell anyone that if you can't, get your head around taking risk, you're never going to get where you really want to be. That's very What true. I mean by taking risk is I, I'm not suggesting that, um, you know, you're going to have to take financial risk if you're going to be in the real estate game. At some, at some point, um, the key is knowing what those risks are that you're taking, because a lot of times as investors, I know when I started out, man, I didn't know anything about risk because I didn't care. Well, it's not that I didn't care. I just didn't know. Yeah. You know, you only as good as what you know. Sure. Uh, as an architect, I knew for a fact that there was no way you were going to stop me from getting a building built that I was going to sell, aside yeah. from doing something illegal that, you know, the city sure. would stop us for. There was no way you were going to stop me from doing that once I had the capital to do it. And, yeah. and I proved that to myself hundreds of times over and I hear banks and I hear all kinds of people say oh it's risky and I'm like it's only risky because you don't understand the process and you're not right. monitoring it right um so you know you're gonna have to take risks those risks can be and sometimes you just need to take a risk that seems uh, sometimes I mean I've taken some I gotta be honest I've taken some risks that are ludicrous most people would say you are just downright crazy for taking that risk. But I realize that if I don't do it, I'm not pushing myself, I'm not stretching myself right. to find out what's on the other side of that. Yeah. And I just go into it knowing that, hey, this could all blow up in my face and I could be bankrupt tomorrow. But, you know, if it works out like I think it will and I think I can make it work, yep. then we're going to be okay. But I bet you those risks you take, like we taught, we teach our calculated risks. They're not, you don't just get up in the morning and go, Hey, let me put a hundred thousand over here or five million over here. I mean, you're you're doing no. your homework. You're doing well, your homework. No. You know, the, the risk is well researched, yes. and there's a solid plan as to how we're yeah. going to execute before we take that risk. Right. But there's still um, you know, it some of the things we've been doing. 
you just there's unknowns there's things like even though we know there's an unknown we they, there's no way to quantify what that is or how it's going to affect i mean uh, take, look, look about look about covid right now right yeah. i mean yeah, this is who, whoever who would have ever thought like I, I know that bill gates did but the average person didn't think well it's going to shut us down we weren't preparing for that necessarily you know we knew something might happen but we didn't know this with the well, whole world I mean, and, and poor bill I mean, with all the money in the world he has, he still couldn't predict when it would happen. Right. Yeah, so right. That's the problem. None of us can predict when it's going to happen. The only thing we can do is prepare, try to have some semblance of, of a plan for what are we going to do when and if that does happen. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, the times when I don't sleep well at night are the times when I don't have a plan as to how I'm going to fix a problem. You know, and I tell everybody this too. We all have problems. That happens to everyone. And just know that. But if you don't look for solutions to your problem, which there are solutions to every problem, and you yep. can find them if you spend the time to look for it, think about it and look for them. And it might take you a couple of days, but there are solutions and you'll find a way to work through that problem if you focus on it. Yeah. Um, don't stick your head in the sand and be an ostrich. That's the worst so thing. It's, it's at whatever and level you are. Hard. It's whatever level you are in life too. It's we. My wife teaches our kids all the time, and we all teach our kids. We say focus on the solution, not the problem. But the same thing's true whether you're dealing with a ten thousand problem, a fifty thousand, or a five million or a fifty million dollar problem. There's a solution right. for it, but you've got to you've got to change your mindset, and you've got to think about it, and you've got to say how do I how can I fix this. Right. right. Yeah. You focus on that and you need to, um, you know, I'd say the other thing is, is knowing as much as you can know about something, because sometimes what will happen is, you know, about something, or at least this has happened to me several times. I'll know about something, um, but I can't really use it at the time. And then a problem comes along and I suddenly go, aha, I know about so-and-so told me I could do X, Y, and Z. Well, now I got this problem maybe I should go see if I can do that and solve my problem. You know, yeah. it's yeah. just knowing what's, what's available to you and having tools in your tool chest to pull out when you need to really use them. Yeah. So, um, awesome. anyway, awesome. well, that's, that's good stuff, Jay. I mean, that's that, that's, you know, all your stuff you're saying is true. And, you know, we all work in different levels. You're like, I said, you're, you're doing these big, massive projects. But you have the same, you have the same fundamental issues that people that are doing houses or people are doing townhouses, same fundamental yeah. issues. And we're, it's all the same mental mindset to overcome them. You just got to gotta learn to deal with it. So and you, I, and you can do it. Anybody you do. can do it. They just have yeah. to want to. You know, you it's just want. like it's just like wanting to change your position in life. If you don't like the way you don't like working nine to five and you want to work for yourself. If you don't if you don't like the fact that you don't make enough money or you, you don't like whatever problem, whatever issue it is you're having, you have to decide that you're going to change that somehow and then go change it. Exactly. You can't just stay at home and eat bonbons and cry in your champagne about uh, <laughs> everything that's wrong in life and not fix it, you yep. know, so. Yeah, Got to take that move. That's why, that's why I enjoy having people like you on the show, just to make sure that people understand that we all go through it, no matter what. Every one of us who's reached a level of success has to go through that. And that's, and then if you want to reach the next level of success, guess what? You got to do it again, yeah. right? It, be, it becomes a habit after a while, though, it becomes you become more and more confident in yourself to overcome the next step every time right. you keep going up there and you start, you can pull from those, like anything in life, once you have experience, you can pull from those experiences and say, okay, now I, I've been through something similar, maybe not as big, but similar. And I can pull on those fundamentals to get through that level and look mm -hmm. back. I always tell people, I say life, life, life has to be lived forward, but it's only understood looking backward. You know, you look back at all the steps it, you came through. So, it, it, you know, one time I had to bankrupt a company. I'd never done that before. It was the scariest thing in the world. But now that I've done it and I saw what happened, I'm like, oh, hell. <laughs> if I had to do that again, this, you know, and actually now I think about what if, if I have to do that again, that's not a big deal. And or if I'm taking some risk and I'm like, what if this puts me into bankruptcy? So, oh, well, you know, I know what happened. So I know what to expect. And, and I think that's a big part of the deal is that and most of us don't a lot of people may not realize this is you know if there's something you're concerned about that might happen to you i bet if you go digging around enough you can find out 
you'll find that other people have already experienced that. And if they can share those experiences with you, you'll have a better understanding of A, what to expect if it does happen to you. And B, you might, it'll probably help you plan around how you won't have that happen to you. So, yeah. you know, I would say all of those painful, painful experiences I've gone through actually give me a lot of strength in knowing that and comfort knowing that I can deal with it if it happens again, or I can, you know, hopefully I can avoid it, you know? So awesome. Awesome. Awesome way to end the show. And so do me a yeah. favor, tell everybody one more time how they can get a hold of you, how they can reach you. So you can reach me at uh, Trivecta Capital Group, uh, dot com. Uh, I also have a website, jmatheson.com. Uh, you can find me there as well. And um, we're on all the social media channels, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Uh, I'm not on TikTok because I don't know what to do with it. Me either. Um, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but that's okay. We'll figure it out. Somebody will figure it out eventually. That's right. Um, awesome. So Great. anyway, that's where you can find awesome. us. Awesome. Well, listen, thanks for being here, Jay. I really appreciate it. Everybody, thanks for listening to the Real Estate of Mind show, and we will see you again next week. Make sure you like and subscribe and leave us a review. And leave us your questions and comments, and we will personally answer. And please share it to anyone you think could benefit. You can find us all over social media at Glenn and Amber Schwarm. We'll see you next week.